Okay, we are live. Great, thank you, Mansoor. Welcome, everyone. As we are live on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitch, please go on now on one of these platforms, whichever you prefer, and share the link with uh, your friends, family, colleagues, and anyone who might be interested as well. I think we have a very exciting topic today uh, to talk about, which is getting to know your users with user interviews. And we will have great Jorge from Fantasy and a couple of other interesting companies. I hope he also shares a bit of his background with you later on. And before we go uh, to talk with him, or before I give stage to him, I want to introduce myself. I am Victoria, Victoria Korzova, which is a very difficult name to pronounce for German. So I'm used to whatever different versions that there are. Uh, I am a product manager with product people. Uh, who are the organizers behind this community event, uh, which we do every Tuesday evening. Uh, my background is in neuroscience. I did a PhD in neuroscience. That's initially how I came to Germany from originally Russia. Uh, and in the last year, I had a lot of fun uh, being part of product people and having a chance to participate in very different projects. You can see a list of uh, different companies I worked with within this time with. And why uh, there were so many projects with this within just one year, as I mentioned, is because of the specifics of what we do. Uh, we, product people, uh, help companies discover and deliver great products faster. And we do this through interim product management roles mainly, uh, which means that we go into a company for three to 36 months. So it varies a lot uh, depending on what kind of uh, mission is there. And then when this mission is ended, we move on to the next company. Uh, we also empower our product community through organizing regular events. So it's an evening event every Tuesday, and we are now working on some new kind of events. So stay tuned, something else interesting is coming. And some use cases when we as uh, product managers interact with companies are one of these five scenarios. It's either because the company, so you got funding and needed to grow your product team by uh, one product manager or more product manager. And while you are looking for full-time employees, you actually want to speed up the process and already start working on the product. We're happy to support you in this initial stages and then help you also recruit the new people. Uh, maybe the PM is going on a parental leave for yeah, three to 12 months. So you know, this can be pretty long in Germany, which I think is very fair. And it's great to give people a chance to enjoy this. And we're happy to cover for them and have support the team. Uh, maybe PM is leaving or have left the company and the hiring takes long. So again, we jump in to cover for this uh, lack of a PM. Or maybe you have a temporary initiative that is important and urgent and it's like time limited project you want to run and you need to PM there or you want to do a appraisal of a product team or processes so you more, need more advisory. In all these uh, different cases, we are happy to support. So if your company is looking for such support or you know a company that is looking for support, feel free to reach out to us. We also have a referral bundle. So if you help us find a new interesting client, we'd be happy to reward you for that. Uh, these are some of our uh, B2C clients and hope maybe some of you know them, uh, especially the ones that live in Germany and in Berlin, uh, Tier, Orishare, uh, Omeo, Zalando, uh, pretty uh, famous names here. We also work a lot with B2B clients. These names might not be that known, uh, but are nevertheless um, important companies that uh, work in very different industries. This is the team of product people that I'm happy to be part of. As you see, we are now um, around 20 people, including a couple of interns, but we are looking for more great people to join our team because um, we are quite successful in acquiring new clients and we need more PMs to help us discover and deliver great products. So if you're interested to be a product manager, uh, or you're interested to be a talent acquisition manager, or you know someone who would be good for this role, please check our account on join. So it's productpeople.join.com. And uh, you can find the descriptions of these uh, positions there. And we're happy, looking forward to your application. And now uh, we're getting ready to invite Jorge to talk with us 
about the user research. But before we finally do that, I have one more thing to uh, entertain you with, which is a small poll. Now the poll will be started by Mansoor in, in Zoom. So for people who are in Zoom, you will see the interactive window popping up. Uh, please use it to answer the questions. Uh, for people who watch us on one of the streams, please just type in the chat wherever you're watching us uh, in the comments, what is your answer to question number one, question number two, question number three. Mansoor, I think you can already start the poll. And meanwhile, I will also read it through. Uh, so question number one, uh, have you ever been part of the user interview from the interviewer side? Simple answer, yes, no. Uh, in your company, who is responsible for user interviews? Uh, are these PMs? Are there special researchers that you have, data analysts, UX UI team, uh, maybe someone else? Uh, we are also curious to hear what else could mean for you. So feel free to type in the chat. Uh, what else, uh, who else is responsible. And also we would like to know what approaches do you use for user research? So interviews, surveys, and PS surveys, usability tests, maybe something else. Very curious uh, generally to know what's the background of our audience today. And I hope this also will be helpful for Jorge to move on uh, with his talk and um, maybe adjust some topics, yeah depending on what uh, what the answers are. So let's see, I see already uh, some answers from YouTube. Uh, for example, for the second one, there is no uh, professional and in some companies yeah, there is no, no one specific who is doing this job. Uh, this might happen. All right, let's see. I see that the poll is finished on Zoom. Let's see what the answers are. Thanks, Mansoor. <laughs> so the question one, uh, have you ever been part of a user interview from the interview site? 79% uh, said yes. So this is pretty experienced audience, apparently. They have participated in the interviews. Uh, who is responsible for user interviews in your company? And here, 79% said PMs and 29 said researchers and 43 said uh, UX UI team. So again, yeah, quite a big proportion of people from product actually participate in this. Uh, what approaches do you use for user research? Uh, the top one is interviews, uh, 86%. A second place is divided between surveys and usability tests. So 50% of uh, the audience use those. Uh, and 20% used NPS surveys, and also some people use some other uh, approaches as well. Uh, let's also me, let me have a look in the chat uh, from YouTube. Some more suggestions what other could be. Um, I know I don't see the answers further. Um, Laura says that the, the function who does the user research in, in the company's CSM. I guess this is customer support manager probably or something similar. So somehow, yeah, customer support can also be a function that participates in, uh, yeah, in doing user research. And now we are ready to, to move on to Jorge. Uh, please welcome on stage. Uh, feel free to share a few words about yourself to set up the stage and I will now be quiet for a bit and enjoy your talk. Welcome. Thank you very much, Victoria. And I have to tell you, I, I felt very identified when you said that you have a very difficult name because my first name is also extremely difficult. So at this stage in my life now, I'm used to looking in the direction right here, anything that resembles it. So I'll pronounce it uh, well for everyone. My name is Jorge. I'm originally from Spain, but I've been in Berlin now working for over 10 years. Uh, by education, I'm actually supposed to be an artist. That's what I studied. But I very much realized that I couldn't become an artist or didn't want to become one. So I moved more into graphic design. That's where I started. I'm from graphic design, more to UX and product design. And from there, I did the jump to product management, which has been a lot of fun the past seven years almost. Uh, but uh, given my past as a UX designer, I've always had like this very much 
user-centric approach to product management and less business approach, even though I do understand that is part of my role. So I've always found like user interviews and finding out more about users extremely important. And that's the reason that I'm going to share with you some, some tips on how to do it and basically my vision of why I think it's extremely valuable. So I will share my screen and hopefully all of you will be able to see my slides. That's good. Excellent. So let me minimize this. And uh, so this is the this was the working title of the of my presentation. And because it was so short, so concise, we decided to keep it like that. No, it wasn't very short or concise, but we realized that it's or I realized that it really expressed well uh, what the usefulness of user interviews were. So getting to know your users through user interviews. And I'm going to try to share with you what I mean by user interviews, why you should do them, how to do them, when to do them, who should do them. And then there is another bonus what that I'll show you at the end, but for that you will have to stay all the way. So for starters, what do I mean by user interviews? Just to get it clear, I mean, none of these things. So some of them were mentioned in the poll, like usability test surveys, NPS surveys, focus groups. On the left, you have some qualitative approaches to, to getting to know your users. On the right, some quantitative ones. So all of these are valuable in themselves and all of this can give you a lot of insights. But when I speak of user interviews, I speak of one-on-one -on -one conversations with users about what they like and dislike about your product, how they use it, and how your product improves their life and how it could improve it even more. So let's unpack this a bit. We have the conversational part, which I think is important, like the, the, the interviews you do with users need to have a degree of conversation to it. Most of the talking should come from the person being interviewed, but you should be ready to change the script a bit, ask more questions, move it around to, to sort of get to know the other side, like if you were in an actual conversation. With users and about your product should be relatively obvious, but I'm just pointing it out there because you can do other type of interviews with potential users or about the market in general or about how other users use other products. So in this talk, I'm concentrating basically on the product you're working in and of your users. And then the last two, the things that they like and dislike and how it makes their life better. They will, users will always have things that they like and dislike about your product and it is your job to find out. And your products must make their life better in some way because if not, they wouldn't be using it. And it's important for you to, to find out how. So why are user interviews important? And this next slide might come as a shock to many of you, but they're important because you're not building products for yourself. So chances are that you're not even in the target demographic of your product. And even if you are, you're still a single individual, which means that your perspective on how to use the product, your own product is unique in that own way. You might use it in a specific way. You might have certain, I don't know, a uh, certain dev <clears throat> device, you might do whatever. Uh, by all standards, if you're a product manager or you work in a tech company, you're a terrible proxy for a general user. So maybe your own experience is not the best thing to, to take as a guidance there. And then lastly, you are emotionally invested in your product. You want it to succeed. You understand why certain things work and others don't. So you, you cannot be building product for yourself. Instead, you need to understand what motivates and frustrates real users. So you need to find out these two things the likes and dislikes and how it makes your life better. Because the likes and dislikes are gonna tell you what is currently delighting and frustrating your users. And the, the other side, how, how it makes their life better is gonna tell you the problems that your product is solving. This is not as obvious as you might think. Uh, you would be surprised how many times uh, users use a product in a different way than what it was intended. So you might know the mission of your product and you might know with what intent you build it. But if you, for example, build a, an app that creates playlists for meditation uh, of music, you might discover that some people use it for meditation, but other people use it for sleep. Other people use it for having just nice music for dinner. And you need to uncover those things. That is a very basic example. But in other cases, the usage might be completely different. Maybe you create a 
peer-to-peer -peer video app to learn languages and people use it for speed dating or so it's important to to keep your mind open there and understand that maybe you don't really know what's going on there so how to actually do user interviews this is the part of the talk that i'm already going to apologize for because it's very dense but i wanted you to take at least a few pointers on what structure i like to use and some tips it is by no means exhaustive for that i would need probably more than a couple of hours so these are just some of the pointers. If you have more questions later, I'll happily answer them. But for starters, how do you need to prepare? You need to find the users to interview. You can do that ad hoc very simply, sending out a mailing, sending out email messages if you are like a, an app, or you can even use targeted ads. Targeted ads usually is more for usability testing of non-existing users or recruiting non-existing users, but maybe in some cases it's also useful. Uh, you can do a better thing, which is regularly try to get users to contact you through banners or automated messages in the user lifecycle. So for example, when a user churns, it would be extremely interesting for you to get, the, get their attention and say like, hey, we would love to talk to you. Please send us an email here or click here and book uh, 30 minutes with us. Or when the user hits the milestone of renewing their subscription, things like that. So that can work very well. And you can even create a user research panel out of that. So keep the emails of all those users you interviewed and contact them later. This is not as useful for continuous interviewing because you want to get new people every time, but maybe for other types of tests, it's good to keep that, that panel there. Uh, and a topic that I've been asked before about incentives, because some people are scared about like, oh, if you offer 20 euros from Amazon, you will only get people that are after the money. I haven't really experienced that a lot. And you, you do need to offer an incentive. You can first try without, uh, but you will have the problem that then you get only the very engaged users that are also maybe very bored and want to do it for free. So don't, don't be scared of offering small incentives, but try to save your company money and start in a low number. Uh, in regards to that, picking the users you're interviewing. So ideally you would want to have a, as representative as possible, kind of like slice of your of your users. So representative in demographics, in how much they use your product, if they're power users or not. So you would want it as random as possible, but of course, in this case, it needs to be curated randomness because the, the users that are gonna immediately respond to your emails that are going to be happy to do the interviews are probably those that are happiest, most engaged and are more extroverted people. So they're going to be the ones easy to get. You need to make an extra effort to try to get users that have churned, users that seem a bit shyer, that are not as intense in their usage. So keep that in mind. And if you see that when you're interviewing people, they all seem to be extreme power users, try to find others that are not. Uh, calendar invites, yes, please. As soon as you have a user that says, yes, I want to be there, make it easy for them, send them out an invite, send all the information possible. Uh, email them before the day before to confirm. You'd be surprised at how many people do not show up and you want to avoid that. So make their life easier. Uh, and then moving on to more your side of the work, preparing the questions. Always remember, depending on what you're trying to find out exactly, you might have to prepare different questions. But do remember your main goals that are to find out how the product makes their life better and what they like and dislike. And based on that, build up the different questions. Definitely avoid yes or no questions unless you have a good follow-up because what you're always going to get is like, do you like X? And you're going to say yes. And then you're going to be stuck there and you don't want that. You want to really get a narrative from, from your users. Uh, and also an important tip is have questions about specific instances of usage. So ask them about the last time they used your product or one time they used it and they were frustrated or you know if they remember the first time they used it. It's important that you try to anchor it on specific occasions. And this last one uh, is kind of optional, but it depends also on the nature of your product. If you can gather all the demographical data that is kind of like more transactional, like age, income, if you're interested, uh, gender, whatever, try to do it separately or otherwise do it at the end after you've extracted the, the important information that you want to have. In terms of conducting the actual interviews, Make sure that you introduce yourself, that you give them all the necessary context. You want them to feel comfortable, informed, know what's going on. 
if you're recording, like I'm so short as now, make sure that you ask for explicit permission and that you tell everyone, this is probably with just one user and be friendly, be warm, give them the psychological safety they need to open up. They're the stars. You need to get it clear that you're interested in their story and to get the way they're used to the product and that there are no right or wrong answers. You're there just to understand them, not to make a judgment on how they use the product. And during the interview, I know that I sound like I'm repeating myself, but this is important. Remember your goals, which is to find out how the product makes their life better and what they like and dislike. Because that means even though you have a script of questions, you need to be able to deviate from that. So you can ask follow-up questions if you need to. You can change the script. You can skip questions. You can go back and forward. This might be a bit difficult for the note taker that will be with you, but you know, you, you'll make your job fun as well. Uh, try to not lead on your, your users to specific answers or topics. This is something that might happen to you unconsciously. You might want to know about something specific and you might move them there. Try to avoid that, or if you do it, do it in a way where you're still able to backtrack. Uh, try to, uh, to avoid showing a lot of emotion in general about their answers. Too much surprise, too much disapproval, or even too much approval. I mean, disapproval is pretty clear. You don't want to be a jerk and you don't want them to feel insecure. But surprise can also be understood as disapproval, and too much approval can also lead them on. You need to be friendly and warm, but at the same time, you need to be to a degree almost like a therapist. Just listening to the story and seeing where it takes you. Uh, try to avoid hypotheticals. So don't tell them, try to avoid telling them like, how would you do X if X, Y, Z happened? This is not a rule written in stone. You can change this a bit, but in general, it's better to try to get your users to stick with what they've actually done and with their experience instead of telling them to put themselves in a situation. Uh, and this one, which I've seen not done a lot of times, but is super useful, is ask your users if they have time at the end if they have any questions themselves. Because you'll find out that there are a lot of like very interesting things that they might ask you of why certain things are not there or why you eliminated a feature or things like that that will tell you more than any of the questions that you ask them. So keep that in mind. And lastly, accept that you can't win them all. Some interviews will be better than others. Some interviewers you won't get anything, others you will hit cold immediately. They will get better as you do more and you will always get the random, like very quiet interviewee that just says yes or no and you don't get anything. In terms of notes and documentation, uh, I'm very partial to keeping full notes. So the full recording with video even better, a full transcript that I like to translate to a language that all the company speaks. If an interview was in German, I always make the effort to translate it into English. This is so everyone in the company can have access to it and look at the whole thing if necessary. Uh, if possible, try to tag it with the demographic data or with the specific topics that came up so that it's searchable later, but this is kind of like the icing on the cake. Uh, and remember your goal one third time, finding out how your product makes it like better, what they like and dislike. So you can check where that information surfaces and explicitly uh, underline it. I, don't have a problem with creating like a shortened version, but sometimes it can be misleading. It can make people realize that, you know, just reading a few of the extracts, you're thinking like, okay, this is all that came out of it. And I think it's important for everyone involved to see the whole thing. But if you have to create some, go for it, include the most important, important conclusions, but try to always guide people to, to look in at the full, at the full documentation. Uh, and then moving on to the next topic, when to do your user interviews. This is much shorter. I hope you'll be happy about that. So I'm talking about cadence, length, and timing. How often you want to do them, ideally weekly. So you need to speak with your users very often. By the way, if you hear a baby in the background, it's my, it's my daughter getting prepared for bed. I'm apologizing for her in advance. Uh, you want to automate the process as much as you can. So this is to make your life easier, but also your user life easier. If you have a Calendly invite that triggers every time uh, someone gets in contact with your interviews at mycompany.com, it'll make your life easier, but it'll also make it more likely that users will, will book interviews. In terms of interview length, this is again, not written in stone, but what I've seen that works best is 30 to 45 minutes. More than that, and people start getting tired, less than that, and it feels a bit rushed. So try to, to avoid more than that. But again, it depends what you're trying to find out and 
this is not a strict rule. And the time of day or week, even less strict, whatever works for you and for your user. But I said before that uh, like user or interviewed people tend to disappear or not show up. This happens especially on Friday evenings and on evenings in general. So maybe try to avoid that time if possible. Who in your team should do user interviews? The short answer is that everyone should, but mainly you, if you're a product manager. Again, this is based on my opinion and my experience. Within the Scrum team, you should be the, the main one involved because you want to get to your users, uh, but you definitely need to involve the product designer. And maybe if you're the product designer, you can take the lead there as well, and potentially even the tech lead. Devs, other teammates, even colleagues from other departments, are free to participate as observers or note takers. In fact, probably it's good if they're involved as observers or note takers to get contact with, with users directly. And if you have the luck of working in a big company that has a dedicated researcher, and that researcher is actually doing the interviews, try to integrate them as much as you can in your team or nudge the rest of the team to participate as observers or as often as you can. Make sure you read the notes and watch the recordings and if possible, even convince the researcher to become an enabler of other people becoming the interviewers instead of being the one that does himself or herself. So to the second one, and I hope that you realize that I have like now this little squared symbol. What is it, is it for you? Why should you do user interviews? Well, you get a lot of like very straightforward goodies. You can validate existing features in a quantitative way, but if you perform enough interviews, you will actually get an almost quantitative validation. You can uncover new opportunities for your product. You can get great feature and improvement ideas. You can understand how your product is really being used and you can gauge how similar or dissimilar you are to the average user. The topic I mentioned before that you're not building product for yourself and that you're a bad proxy is where you can find out how bad a proxy you are. But there's even more to this because all these previous things are kind of like very straightforward and very kind of like concrete deliverables. There is something more, but for that, I need to give you sort of like a bit of context. If you're working in product management, you realize that we work with a lot of ill-defined problems and ill-defined problems are those that do not have right or wrong answers. They have infinite solutions. They just have better and worse ones. So doing a lot of very deep data dives and trying to get all the information will not work because you can only reduce risk, not eliminate it. And gathering a lot of data is time costly and your time is limited and your resources are limited as well. So having a way to speed up correct decision making without having to add more resources is very valuable. Some call this intuition and consider it something almost magical. But the problem with this concept of intuition is that it has a very bad rap. Not everyone understands how it works. And most of us are terrible at gauging how good our own intuition is. Uh, so in most companies, if you say data, everyone will be fine with it. Everyone will give you a check mark. But if you say intuition, you will immediately get a no because your gut feeling is not good enough. But in actuality, data and intuition are not that different. Uh, and they're not opposed to the very least. They're just different ways to process information. In the case of data, you have very specific conscious and explicit reasoning based on information that is verifiable. In the case of intuition, you're still doing something similar, but it's just hidden or what I would call pre-conscious. So in the case of data, I know that A is true. I know that B is false. Therefore, we should do C. This is pretty cut and dry. With hidden reasoning, I have a good feeling about A. I have a bad feeling about B. I think we should do C. These are the same premises, the same conclusions are just arrived at a different ways. And in fact, they're both deductive processes. So you have kind of like a step process where you get from premises to, to a conclusion. The difference here is that the premises of intuition are not based on having pulled the data from the data lake and seeing the proportion of A versus B. They're based on an inductive process. Probably if you have a good feeling about A, You've encountered in your past life as a product manager or as a designer, a lot of experiences with things similar to A. And pay attention to the sign here. You're never gonna have encountered exactly what you're encountering now, but you will have had the experience of many of these instances of something similar. So you have this gut feeling of like, okay, this should work because I've seen similar things working a lot of the times. 
And this is fine as an intuition, but the problem here is that you're basing it on yourself. And finally, the payoff for all this talking, if you manage to make this intuition work or the inductive process of your intuitions work instead of from yourself, from user experience, and by I mean use, so experience from the users you've interviewed, suddenly you make the feeling good about A an actual almost data-driven decision because you based this uh, qualitative gut feeling in an inductive process where you have many of these similar cases. And you can even track them back to show people that your stakeholders will say like, okay, it's just a gut feeling. So, you know, what is it needed for you really if you interview enough users and if you develop this, this capacity? You can develop your product intuition, which will allow you to effectively empathize with your users, connect with their likes, dislikes, and goals, and that will make your product decisions faster and better, which is what we all want as product people. So I think it's well worth it. And I hope you enjoyed the talk and agree with me. And if not, you can tell me now. And thank you very much for joining. Paul, oh, here goes the applause, uh, which are silent on the internet, but they are here. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was very interesting insights, Jorge. And I really enjoyed the last bit about data and intuition. Because that it was somehow so my experience that there are some things you cannot really necessarily find data for, or it looks like it will take you actually lo longer to dig up out data and then make a decision rather than do something based on your intuition and then gather user feedback. Mm -hmm. But as you said, in many cases, it's frowned upon. So you're like, yeah, but you're not supposed to do that. Thanks so much for sharing this. Happy, happy to share and now happy to get like hate mail from all the data analysts. All right, there are already questions uh, in the chat on um, YouTube, so I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Pavel is saying excellent presentation. Questions, can you give us an example that you faced where the product was making the life better for users, I guess, but it was not making that uh, what the company or management expected? And what happened after? Sure. I, I mean, I can give you I feel like a very a historical example. So Instagram used to be an app kind of like ripped off of Foursquare, where the initial intention was for people that loved whiskey to uh, check in in different whiskey bars and upload pictures of the whiskey they were drinking and leave comments. Uh, it was actually called bourbon and very soon in their life cycle they realized that the checking in and the making specifically about whiskey was not really solving anyone's problem but that the photo upload was very popular so they decided to scrap everything and make it Instagram so mm -hmm. that's that's the the best example I can think of where the, the awareness of actually we're not solving the problems we think we are led to to a better product Oh, interesting. Uh, Pavel, if you have a follow-up on that, uh, feel free to type more. Um, meanwhile, I wanted to ask some more technical questions. I have actually two. So one is, it's great when you have the users and then you can actually confirm existing product with them, but mm -hmm. have you had experience with when you don't have the users yet? So you are working on the MVP and Every, like, every good book on PM would tell you you have to first check that you are solving the real problem, the real pain of the user. How do you get people who are not your users get? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can still definitely interview them and you can still try to extract that information from them, but it's true that you need to approach it differently. So you, the, the way I would do in that case is like really find out if the the problem that you're trying to solve exists there and asking them won't be enough because you can ask them like hey do you have this problem and maybe they say yes maybe they say no so try to find mm -hmm. out if they have any any other products or solutions or workarounds that they currently use uh try to find out how much they would be if they perceive it as a problem i think that maybe is a good start like if if, I, if you ask people and none of them perceive it as a problem then maybe you not necessarily, but maybe you're not on, on something mm. that might work immediately. 
Uh, and just at that point, maybe instead of interviewing people, I would look for uh, competitors for, for other companies that do solve a similar problem that you do and try to, I mean, try to get people that use that product. You mm. know, it sounds a bit like spionage and ask them similar questions to what you would ask and, even, and then even show them your MVP and see what they think. But you're always going to get some information, but, but it's a tough one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for finding these people, one way you suggest is to try to find places where people are using the competitor product you could do forms or something. If you mean to specifically find them like out of the blue completely, mm. and if you if you have the money to spend, you can always use targeted ads on on Facebook or other platforms. You can see what interests mm. uh, people have, or you think will will go with that. If you don't have uh, any kind of budget for that, honestly, then you need to be imaginative. Then you need to ask. You need to turn people that you have access to into potential users. So you need to put them into the, the mentality and deal with hypotheticals. Mm. But that is not ideal. At least it would get you to some steps. But yeah, those, mm-hmm. that's how I would approach it. I think. All right. Got it. Thanks. My second question also combines good with two more questions from Zoom. So I will read those first. Um, can you give an example of automating the user interview process? Uh, from Reem and then from Nikolai, uh, what software do you use to manage your interviews? I actually also had a question regarding software. I know there are mm. softwares that help you log the interview, like do, do notes and so on. Have you had experience mm. with something? What do you think about that? So I, I mostly just use Zoom or Google Meet, record the screen, uh, share a prototype with, well, in the, in the case of interviews, there's generally no prototype to share, but I generally just use Zoom or any other software that you want. There are tools that I used in the past, but they changed name and now by the, the like I cannot remember the name, but there was the, there are a few tools out there, but mainly I think they're used more for usability tests. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for the added value of having the notes being taken and being able to be replayed at the same time as the, as the interview. I don't think for interviews exclusively they're worth the money, but if you're also doing mm-hmm. like usability tests or preference tests, then, then maybe the sense that our website out there, Usability Hub, I think is one. Uh, and actually that also serves to, to gather like them of people you want to interview, uh, but I mainly just Zoom or Meet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And any tips on how to automate user interview process? Any specific? The I think the uh, create like a, an integration of your calendar with Calendly and let them book themselves. Uh, automate mm-hmm. what I mentioned before. So if you, if you already have a, already have a running product, have a banner or an email that is sent automatically or some kind of in-app uh, push notification, push notific- whatever that asks them after a certain number of sessions to to sign up for for a thing and then connects them to your Calendly. So once it's set up, you just wait to get the like the bookings done, and hmm. you can take it from there. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thanks. Um, Nikolai, I hope it helps. If you had questions about some more specific software, please uh, go ahead to ask. Uh, Reem, the same. Uh, if you have a follow up, please go on. And meanwhile, I will take a question from YouTube from Laura. A uh, question regarding the interview. If a user gives ideas about the product, uh, they might ask if it's possible and when will it be developed? So how to react without saying, we'll see and we will let you know. So how, what do you recommend? So when, when a user uh, sort of said like, when, when, will we, when will I have this feature that I think is a good idea? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you, generally I tend to be as honest and as candid as possible. I tell them like, Hey, look, that sounds good, and I think we we can we can look into it. But there's you know we we have a lot of things going on, and you know we, we need to see it. You don't need to be super specific. You don't need to tell them actually. I think this won't work, but you can tell them that you look into into it. And if they, I've never experienced of a user become very pushy and say like, I really want this. If not, I'm going to churn. Uh, I have experienced like on B two C having mm. like feature requests from from clients. Like doing user interviews with clients versus users 
our customers versus users in the case where they're different is also slightly different to this. You need to be much more careful. And generally you'll have like a sales team making sure that you don't say anything stupid and kind of like as the gatekeepers. Uh, but for normal like users in a B2C product, I try to say like, hey, sounds good. We'll, we'll look into it. Were there cases when users would be telling about something to you and you decided not to do this feature and why? Yeah, most of the cases, like, I mean, normally users, no, it's, it's just the way most mm -hmm. of us think. We think in solutions and mm -hmm. you, I've, I've gathered like a lot of ideas. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining here how important it is to speak with your users. So I love when users come with feature ideas or, or colleagues as well, but it's important to understand that the, you know, you need to understand like what, what problem or what opportunity would this solution be addressing? Because it's mm -hmm. it's it's uncommon for uh, a user to a user can tell you what they want, but maybe they're still thinking very much from their their own perspective and kind of like within the limitations. Maybe you can find a much better way of solving that problem. So for me, it's always a question of finding out when they say they wanted X, what did they really want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's more to identify. The, solution, the problem or the pain point based on what people say and then solve this one. And it might be very different from what they have suggested. Exactly, yeah. Makes sense. Um, Eva is asking uh, more towards the last part on data versus intuition. Uh, could you give us an example when you encountered an ill-defined problem and your intuition helped more than get gathering data? Mm. I mean, I'm trying to think of specific examples, uh, which I might have a hard time because I deal with intuition very often. Uh, but in general, I, I can think of cases, for example, at a Fitchery where we did have a very, very strong data team. Uh, and it's not so much that my intuition kind of like got in the way of data or ever negated it, but data always told us uh, where we were or the what, but it rarely told us the why. So mm -hmm. in this case, I don't know if the answer is satisfied, but being speaking with a lot of users and seeing how it was used actually gave more meaning to the data itself and allowed us to use the data differently. Uh, but again, I think intuition gets a very bad rap because a lot of people use it as a, I feel this way and we're going to do it that way, especially a lot of people. So people that can manage to say, you need to trust me on this one, we're going to do it like that. But you can try to make like this or in other ways your intuition a bit more structured by seeing what were the similar instances and you almost turn it into data. So, sorry, not a very satisfying answer, but uh, that's the best I can come up with right now. If you have a follow-up, let me know and I'll try to make it better. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. Thanks for uh, being direct <laughs> in the yeah. answer. Uh, here, Marion is asking, uh, do you have any tips on how to reveal these pain points? I think it refers to the question we had before. If people don't tell you what their actual problem is, mm -hmm. either because they are unaware or don't want to tell you. Yeah, that's where the, I mean, one thing is they don't want to tell you that if the topic is very sensitive or mm -hmm. personal, which I've had experience with, you need to be extra extra safe in the sense of like really making them understand that there is no judgment, there is nothing. You, you need to go the extra mile to make sure that they, they feel safe on that. And you can look up how your body language is. You can sort of mm -hmm. reinforce that point. You can even offer them to, to not record it and to just do the thing. So that is in the part where they don't want to share it. The part where they are not aware of the problem, that is, I would say, partially the product manager role of a user is going to know the things that frustrate them, the things that they like and dislike, but they're going to know it at a very kind of like surface level. So it is your job to understand that. If it's a completely hidden problem that they cannot even conceive, then maybe interviews are not the best. But if you're able to kind of like join the dots between what they say they find frustrating uh, and then the underlying problem, that is more on your side, I would say. So you need to find what questions to ask, how to ask follow-up questions to like, okay, you said you had this bad experience with a product. Why was that a bad experience? And find the read between the lines there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Do you think also when it feels like the user gives you the solution, but you feel it does not really tell the problem, does it help to maybe ask them around the process around this issue? Like, mm -hmm. tell me when, when, why did, when did this came to your mind, right? What, what were you doing? Mm -hmm. Kind of to understand what's the context. I, sure. I mean, uh, usually I'm not super specifically interested in the process they used to come up to that conclusion, but I am interested mm -hmm. in knowing why that solution would solve the problem. So you can always ask like, mm -hmm. oh, so you, you think that this would work? Why, how would it make your life better to, to have this? And then they can explain. And by the things that they point out, and the ones that they do not point out, you can understand like what their main pain point is because a solution might mm. be very specific to, to their own views, but maybe another similar solution would cover many more problems. So mm -hmm. in, in the end, you're always trying to get to that. Like if they came up with this solution, uh, they, they had a problem in their mind, even if it wasn't conscious, so try to uncover it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, more questions. So, a question from LinkedIn. Uh, what are your experiences with tackling strong self selection bias in users of existing products? For example, only power users signing up for interviews. I know mm. you referred to this uh, partially in the talk, but maybe you can give more, uh, more tips around that. Sure. Uh, it, it is a very common problem that you not, not only power users, but also extroverted people in general are going to be more likely to, to be there. So, mm. Uh, I think the first due diligence that you need to do is look at what the, and this is looking into data, not into user interviews, but you need to understand what the distribution is of your user base, like what percentage are power users, what are regular users, and where those kind of like mm, frames are, where are the limits. And then you need to ask that question or find that out when you interview people. So that if you, if you know, for example, that only 10% of your users are power users based on your uh, whatever benchmark you have but out of the last 10 people you interviewed eight of them were power users then at least you know you have that problem so surface is the first thing label them as power users in your your documents so you know you can always kind of like weight their their importance later and then like i said double down on trying to find users through like giving uh, more incentives through ads or other pushes and maybe if you really need to, to get rid of the users that are extremely power users, even ask within the process of uh, getting them to sign up, like, you know, how many hours do you use your product today or look up their, their user if you have access to that and already get rid of them and go only specifically for the ones that are only partial users. Something that works very well as well is mailing directly churned users because those are if you have a subscription model you can know when they have churned or if they have had no activity mm -hmm. in a long time uh, but again you to, to find it sort of in the middle you need to cast your net and then get rid of the fish that you don't want mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thanks that that are good points um and yeah knowing what maybe all of your users are extroverted right <laughs> there is no mm -hmm. problem it's a good how do you would how would you measure this though? Is there yeah. a way that you practice how, how extroverted are my users? Not really. I mean, you can you can make certain assumptions based on your mm. like on your user base, their age, and stuff like that, and the type of product that you have. Mm. If, if you have a product about how to deal with uh, being an introvert, then probably most of your mm. users are not extroverts. But that's a very straightforward example. But it's just it's just something to take into account that uh, mm. you know the the uh, it's not availability bias that's something different but that the people that are going to be easiest to reach are the ones that are maybe not necessarily representative. There mm -hmm. is no as far as I know there is no scale to measure extrovertedness, but I'd love to hear one if it is. I guess there are some tests that you may one maybe can try to mm. apply as part of uh, I don't know question there. Anyways, um, Laura, we are happy that you have more questions. And the next question from Laura is, did you ever do, do group interviews so that they discuss between them too? Uh, for example, mm -hmm. games, brainstorming, and some other approaches to group uh, discussions with users. So I actually have very little experience with focus groups or group interviews. 
so I cannot really give information that I can, I can tell you why, at least for me, uh, they, they don't serve the same purpose as these direct user interviews, because if you have a group, you're always gonna have like this group dynamics going on where again, the less, less extroverted people are going to be the quieter ones and, and the more, mm. sorry, the other way around. So basically you're gonna make it even worse because you're gonna get like one person in the end talking more. But like I said, I don't have a lot of experience there, so I cannot give tips. I'm sure that it has a lot of usefulness for, for other purposes, but not for, for this, at least for me. Yeah, well, you're curious, Laura, if you had some experience and you, you want to share and hear maybe Jorge's feedback, please uh, go ahead. Um, I'm guessing it might be kind of dangerous but because group dynamics is special and it can also promote biases. Um, mm -hmm. There is a very uh, famous um, movie from <laughs> Soviet times, <laughs> not that people know, but it's a documentary about cognitive biases and there is a super cool example where there's like a, a bunch of kids, I don't know, maybe six, seven kids, and they, uh, one kid is a test subject and others are kind of in agreement with the, um, uh, with the teacher and the teacher brings something which is white and then asks the kids what color is that and all kids who agree they say black and the last kid the kid who is uh, like in test is very nervous is last person and like m most of the kids said black because they just followed the group right <laughs> why would uh, you disagree uh, yeah, no, no. absolutely and there is even they made a similar experiment i think in stanford not with kids, mm -hmm. but with like university students, where the teacher mm -hmm. would draw like two lines, one clearly shorter than the, than the other one and ask like which one is longer. And even adults would like go with the crowd because you don't, you don't want to be the one standing up. So, but this goes back to this like psychological safety and in interviews, making sure that mm -hmm. you get it to the other side. Like, look, I'm interested in the way you use it and there is no wrong and right. This is really, you know, you are the, the king or queen in this case. So tell me, tell me what you like, tell me what you don't. You know, I'll, I'll listen. Yeah. Thanks. I'm checking that there are no more questions yet, but I do have something um, else. It's always very interesting to hear some examples from, from experience. So I'm wondering if you could share some. One question would be, do you have some um, things in your mind where you were very surprised by the user feedback, like something that you have never expected or your intuition before that was suggesting something different. Mm -hmm. And this is one. Another, I'm curious if you had saw some very interesting examples of differences between users of the different products you worked with. Mm -hmm. I don't know, for example, Outfitry and Fantasy, there should be very different users. It's what different. were the yeah, sure. D different genders, different. Yeah, no, it's it's mm. completely different. Be before I go into specific examples, I can tell you the the topic of being surprised by mm -hmm. by like user interviews. I would say that one of the signs that you are doing a good job at uh, having like a good cadence of user interviews is when you start to be surprised less often, because that means that you've encountered already like a, a lot of things. So. If you're surprised every week, then you need to do more interviews because either your user base is very diverse or you haven't done enough. Uh, but, but this is if you do it properly, right? But if you bias your subject towards certain answers, you might be never surprised. And then... True, true, true. Also, I mean, you'll be surprised at least for the first couple of weeks, I would say, but then okay. it will become... So maybe that's the next rule. Like if, if only after two weeks you're not surprised any longer, then you need to expand your, like your net. That's a fair point. Mm. And then with examples, I can tell you, for example, at Choco, and for those of you that don't know, Choco is kind of like a two-sided marketplace of restaurants on the one side and suppliers on the other, and they use the app to make orders of food. What surprised me, but it shouldn't have had because that was what the product was about, was the level of stress, uh, overwork, and, and coordination and organization that is required to run a restaurant and the absolute like high value that people working at restaurants put on anything that would make their life easier. So we, mm -hmm. we had a, it was a very simple product. Like I said, it was just a kind of aggregator of all the different communication channels that they had with suppliers and one point of view, but it saved them one hour a day 
which for them was like the difference between getting home and saying hello to their partners or not. So sometimes the, the different value that people get out of what I would consider smaller things. Mm. In, in the case of Outfitry, I think what surprised me that shouldn't have had was the uh, how many of our users were, because we, we did try to make an effort of expanding the users we got. And at Outfitry, we wanted to, to go for this demographic of like fashion aware uh, users, people that were interested in that. And we discovered by casting the nets, the nets very wide, how most of our users were actually just interested in convenience. I mean, like, look, I want someone else to, to take care of it. And I don't want to, I don't care if this shirt is 2010 or 2022. I just want to, you give me stuff and I wear it. And in the, in the case of fantasy, I, I, you know, I don't want to give up a lot of stuff, but you, I did find surprising on the ways the, the product was used, for example, like in general fantasy were like, is still a product of erotic stories for women. And so very explicit content and uh, kind of focused at uh, masturbation. So I was surprised that some of the users would listen to the stories when doing everyday activities like going shopping mm -hmm. or stuff like that. So you, you always discover kind of like very things that you would have never thought that uh, your product would be used like that. But then lo and behold, it is. So yeah, those, those would be three examples. I believe. Cool. Thanks so much for sharing. I do not see any more questions in our chat. So I think we're getting ready to, to close. Uh, big thanks to everyone for participation, for your questions. And of course, big thanks to Jorge for sharing his tips. Uh, very happy that there were like some practical advice, but also we talked about some more philosophical aspects like uh, intuition versus data and so on. And there are more thank you messages uh, in the chat. So. Thanks, Jorge. With this, mm -hmm. I am going to show the last slide and invite all of you to join us on the next event. Uh, we have every Tuesday evening in Germany. If you're in different country, maybe check what time is it for you. But uh, for us, it's every Tuesday evening. Uh, we have a product management talk here. Uh, we also have a community chat uh, in Telegram, Get Product People. Uh, where you can come and ask questions uh, or share some tips um, from yourself. We're very happy to hear from everyone in the community. And if you would like to support us, uh, we have a Patreon. We do this basically voluntarily on our free time after work. So uh, you will help us if you give us a bit of money to pay for the tools that we use to, to run the event. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you again. Thanks, Jorge. Bye.